Thank you, Dave, for the positive review. I didn't know about that until now. So, um, well, thank you for having me today. I'm new to this symposium, so uh, I guess I haven't met most of you yet. Um, what I'll try to do today, what uh, Jennifer, Ron, um, and Dave asked me to do, is to introduce a little bit the uh, unknowns. Um, the title, the original title of my talk was incredibly long and I cut it down. It's still very long and <laughs> complicated. Uh, so I'll try to simplify a little bit, as much as possible, some uh, aspects of uh, um, mitochondria function in general, hoping that that will help you later on with the rest of the day to better understand what we're trying to do, or what our scientists are actually trying to, and clinicians trying to do, and how to tackle certain specific problems in Friedrich ataxia. Uh, how do I advance the slides? Uh, this one? Yeah, green button. Okay. So, um, you all, uh, I'm going to be on this side because I'm right handed. I, I don't think I can. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as you well, very well know, uh, Friedreich ataxia is a genetic mitochondrial disease. But uh, I guess what I'll try to do this morning, uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, is to uh, go over uh, certain fundamental aspects of mitochondria biology, meaning really uh, trying to uh, go over what mitochondria are and what their function is in the cells. And that will help understanding what the problem is when mitochondria don't function properly. So mitochondria are uh, intracellular organelles. Um, they're uh, structural and structurally and functionally um, independent units, which work in the cell um, to provide a number of functions. And uh, a good deal of uh, what mitochondria can do is actually related to their structure. And uh, this is a very simplified uh, representation of a mitochondria, kind of a, something that you find in a textbook. Um, and mitochondria, as you can see here, uh, are, cons are made of uh, two layers of membranes. Uh, what we call the outer membrane, the external membrane, um, which is really like a container, like a bag. And then inside, another order or layer of membranes, which is highly invaginated, forming all these structures that we call criste. And those are important because all the enzymatic, most of the enzymatic processes that occur in mitochondria are actually localized onto this criste. And so the reason why there are so many of them is because that allows mitochondria to perform a lot of work, having a lot of this important machinery condensed inside them. And uh, this is really uh, a more realistic uh, uh, version of the mitochondria. And it's, uh, um, a projection of um, um, electron microscopy, tomography, like a CT scan of, of a, a real mitochondrion in the liver, in this case of a rat. It doesn't really matter. You can see that things are not as neatly organized as they are in the cartoon. Um, but, but definitely there is a lot of this crystal material inside, and, uh, and so the yellow being the outer membrane, the green are the crystal, and the red is the outer membrane that uh, encloses everything. Another very important thing, at least from my perspective, and you know, years of my work have been dedicated to this, uh, is the fact that unlike any other organelle or structure inside the cell, mitochondria are under the control of two genomes. So you all know the DNA, you all know the nucleus of the cell probably, which contains all our genetic material, most of our genetic material. But not everybody knows that mitochondria are actually endowed of their own DNA, with their own DNA. It's a very little uh, molecule. Uh, it contains certain genes uh, which have been basically uh, transmitted to us throughout evolution, probably for several billion of years. And of course, during evolution, this molecule has been modified. It shrunk a lot. A lot of the genes that were originally in the mitochondria have been transferred to the nucleus. But yet, uh, cells have to maintain, as mitochondria have to maintain their own uh, mitochondria DNA. And the re I'm not going to get into the, re the evolutionary reasons for that. It doesn't really matter so much to us right now. But what matters is that uh, these genes contained in here um, 
encode, they uh, specify for, for cer certain proteins, which are absolutely fundamental for the survival of the cell and the function of the mitochondria, of course. Um, and and it, the complexity of this system is uh, exemplified by the fact that these proteins that are formed in the mitochondria, starting from this DNA molecule, actually have to uh, somehow coalesce. They have to get together with the proteins that are encoded by the, the nuclear genome, such as, for example, frataxin, uh, which are uh, made in the uh, outside of the mitochondria, but then need, they need to be imported into mitochondria. And so the result of this is a functioning mitochondrion. And you know, so what does the mitochondrion do? Um, some of you might have heard uh, that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and that's true. Uh, to some extent, that's true. So it's one of the main sources of the energy uh, that keeps the cells alive, all cells, basically. I forgot to say at the beginning that um, every single cell of our bodies basically contain mitochondria. There are, there's one exception, uh, red blood cells, which do not have mitochondria, but they don't even have a nucleus or DNA. So in a way, you can consider them sort of remnants of cells. Everything else in our cells has mitochondria, in our body has mitochondria and strongly needs mitochondria. Uh, so this looks complicated, but believe me, it's not that hard uh, to, um, I'll try to simplify some of this concept because uh, I think it's important for us to understand what mitochondria do. So um, first thing, that mitochondria do, is to take up nutrients. So everything that we eat gets converted into energy that keeps cells alive. And um, of course, uh, organs like the liver and even inside you know, muscle cells and brain cells, there are a number of enzymes that break down those nutrients that we eat and simplify them. And those simplified molecules, pyruvate, this is just an example, um, get imported inside mitochondria. And once they get inside mitochondria, they are taken up by these enzymes, uh, this uh, energetic machinery that I briefly mentioned before, and they get converted into energy. Now the end product, the end product of this conversion is what we call uh, ATP. ATP is a molecule, it's like the currency uh, the energetic currency of the cell. Everything that the cell does requires this molecule. It's a simple way to store energy that the cell uses, and this energy is mostly produced by the mitochondria. And they do that through a series of enzymatic reactions. And I'm, I'm just briefly mentioned that in, a, in a, um, the next slide, so I'm not going to go over that right now. Uh, I also wanted to tell you, though, that yes, mitochondria are um, the powerhouse of the cell, but they're also in charge of other very, very important uh, functions, which actually, in the case of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Friedreich ataxia, could be perhaps even more important than making energy. And one of them is to keep the balance of certain ions, such as calcium, in check. That's very, very important because cells that are excitable, such as neurons in the brain, heart, skeletal muscle, all these cells become excited and um, activated, basically, by their levels of calcium. And mitochondria are kind of the gatekeeper of this calcium. So when calcium becomes too high in the cell, mitochondria use their energy to take this calcium up. And if that fails, Typically what happens is that the cell becomes intoxicated with calcium and dies. Another thing that mitochondria do, and I think that we'll talk about this quite a bit today, is to produce something that uh, we call uh, free radicals or oxidative stress. Um, we hear about oxidative stress in all kinds of forms nowadays, uh, you know, in the context of aging, in the context of beauty products. Um, and all kind of things. Um, but uh, free radicals, in truth, um, we call them ROS for simplicity, reactive oxygen species. Um, these ROS are not only bad things. In fact, we know now, the past few years, especially in the mitochondrial field, that we need some levels of ROS. Uh, without ROS, 
basically cells lose their bearings. Uh, one of the most important things that regulate mitochondria production, so how many mitochondria cells have, is in fact ROS. So there is a delicate balance uh, between how much ROS you can make for signaling, we call it signaling, so this conversation that there is between, for example, mitochondria and the nucleus, to know how many proteins need to be made. All that is partly regulated by this ROS. Too much ROS, however, is certainly a bad thing, and I'll show you in a minute why. And, and I think uh, uh, Rob Whitson in, will talk about it much more than I <laughs> do. Um, lastly, what I want to say is that, and I like, I like uh, to call a mitochondria sort of the um, crossroad between uh, maintaining life and death uh, of the cell. Why? Because um, mitochondria are also the initiating point of a phenomenon that is called programmed cell death or apoptosis. And uh, apoptosis is, is really a process whereby cells disintegrate. They die and disintegrate. And it sounds bad, but actually it's not all that bad. For example, apoptosis is the mechanism through which the body gets rid of cancer cells. And uh, during development, the fetus, for example, eliminates a lot of extra material that it doesn't need through apoptosis. So apoptosis is, and that apoptosis is initiated in the mitochondria. Um, so apoptosis is, is actually a physiological phenomenon, but if there is too much of it, or if mitochondria suffer because they have functional problems, they can trigger this mechanism in cells that you don't want to lose, such as, for example, your neurons or your heart cells. So again, mitochondria are positioned, strategic, strategically positioned in the cell uh, in a very, very crucial place. And this is what um, I promised to do uh, briefly. I just want to go over um, certain fundamental mechanism whereby these mitochondria make energy. The reason for doing that is because frataxin has a very fundamental role in keeping this function. So I mentioned to you that the substrates, or sorry, the nutrients get into the mitochondria. And in mitochondria, they undergo, uh, again, further modifications uh, in uh, different enzymatic paths, in the complexes of enzymes put together to, to produce very simple molecules that then the mitochondrion can use to make energy. And this is the NADH, uh, for example. Uh, you know, sometimes you see NADH um, in, in beauty products or uh, nutritional products. Uh, it is indeed one of the fundamental um, molecules inside mitochondria to provide uh, energy. Um, the reason why these are, um, I would say, relevant to uh, Friedrich attacks is because a lot of the enzymes that uh, work in these uh, pathways actually require frataxin to be properly generated. In the absence or when frataxin is too low, several of the enzymes of these um, pathways become deficient. And so not enough NADH is produced, for example. And this whole system of um, energy conversion, which we call the respiratory chain. Uh, it's called the respiratory chain because literally that's what it does. It respires. It consumes the oxygen that we breathe in. So the reason why you need to breathe, by the way, is because there is oxygen in the air and that oxygen is almost entirely consumed by your mitochondria to run this whole process. And uh, what it consists uh, is um, basically creating uh, energy, an energy um, gradient. I don't want to get too, too much into details with this. But basically, there are these four fundamental respiratory chain components, simply defined as number one, two, three, and four here. And these ones take protons from inside the mitochondria, and they pump them outside. And that creates a gradient. It's like a... Um, it's like the battery of the car, basically. So you have positive charges accumulating inside, outside, negative charges inside, and that creates a voltage. And that voltage, yeah, simple as it seems, that's what drives the cells in your body. And where that, when that voltage-making machinery fails, because frataxi cannot provide the fundamental component to make it, the energy in the mitochondria fails. And what happens when that mechanism fails is that the tendency of this 
process of these uh, enzymes to produce ROS, the free radicals, is enhanced. So normally a little bit of ROS is produced, as I told you, it's good stuff. But when the enzymes that require frataxin to be generated start failing, too much ROS is produced. And this is especially a problem in the presence of iron because the hydrogen peroxide is one of the fundamental byproducts of this ROS, can react with the iron and form something that we call hydroxy radical, this molecule OH with a little dot, and that molecule is the bad free radical. That one is really bad. So when this molecule is produced, if there is too much ROS, too much free iron, they can give uh, rise to this so-called fent fenton is the guy, the person who actually described this reaction, the chemist. And the fenton reaction can fundamentally destroy the components of the mitochondria, but not just the mitochondria. They can cause mutations in the DNA. They can destroy lipids. And I think uh, Rob will talk a little bit about uh, this, this issue of lipid oxidation. Um, things that eventually kill the cells. So from what I told you so far, I think you can already guess um, what the consequences of mitochondrial dysfunction can be in the cells. So if we have respiratory chain defects, so defects of that apparatus that converts the energy in the mitochondria, uh, there are two scenarios, really, that I can envision, simplifying a little bit. One is that this occurs very acu acutely, and the prototypical example of this is a stroke when the, or, or a heart infarct. When that happens, there is just not enough oxygen reaching the tissue. So even though all the, all the enzymes are in place in the mitochondria, there is simply not enough oxygen to run the whole machinery. This happens within seconds or minutes. And the drop in energy is extreme. And basically, that leads to necrotic cell death, like instant death of the cell. But in most cases, this is not what, what happens. In most cases, for example, when there is a genetic disorder, this is a uh, limiting um, situation. So there is some uh, respiratory chain. There is obviously enough oxygen, but not enough to run things normally. And so what happens is that you have chronic effects. The chronic effects result in reduction, what well, this, this symbol here means, the membrane potential, that energy, that electrical energy that I told you about across the membrane of the mitochondria, that is decreased. There is an increase in ROS, as I mentioned to you before. These two things combined can lead to further damage because the ROS can damage the mitochondria themselves. And this further damage eventually can lead to that phenomenon of apoptosis or cell death, which is undesirable in most cells, especially in adult life. And so you can see how chronic respiratory chain defects in the mitochondria are sufficient to cause a chain of events which will eventually result in the death of the cells. And uh, so the, the question now is, as I told you before, every single cell has mitochondria, but if you have a mitochondrial disease, such as Friedreich ataxia, well, many systems are involved many tissues, many organs, but not all of them. And so this has, has always been a mystery, um, to some extent, a mystery in, uh, in the field, the field of mitochondrial diseases. Why only certain tissues? And this is, um, I pulled this out of the um, internet, and it doesn't refer specifically to Friedreich ataxia. I think it's something that can be general. In fact, it's, it's not complete. I would add to these uh, organs that are affected, certainly the ear, because uh, hearing loss is an important problem, not only Friedreich attacks, in all mitochondrial disorders. Uh, we have the eye, of course. I would add to this the endocrine pancreas, um, so you know the organ that produces insulin, because as we know, we all know, uh, diabetes can be a problem. So what is the common denominator between all these tissues? We can only guess. Uh, one obvious explanation is that these are tissues that require a lot of energy. So 
require a lot of that ATP molecule that I told you about. And it, it, it's, it's clear the skeletal muscle, you know, especially if you're exercising, consume most of the ATP of your body. The brain consumes, uh, at rest, the brain consumes probably the largest portion of the ATP in your body. So does your, the heart, etc., etc. But it's, this is probably not the whole uh, issue. And there are other issues involved. And one of them could be, for example, how good certain cells as a, uh, are, in comparison to others, in dealing with this ROS. We, know, we don't know why, but we know for a fact that certain cell types have much better antioxidant defenses than others. For example, calcium handling, um, the ability to maintain this ion Ions, as I told you before, are very important for certain cells, like the neurons. The skin cell maybe doesn't care as much about calcium. Um, so you can now, if you think about all these things together, you can start imagining a scenario where under duress, in the presence of very limiting amounts of rotaxin, certain cell types will become affected faster and the cell will die earlier. So uh, I had a few, s how, are, how are we doing with time? Let me see, just, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I know Ron is gonna, I've seen his slides, so is, uh, Rob, sorry, is gonna talk a little bit about uh, the genetics of Friedrich Ataxi. I'm sure you've heard this many times, so it's probably not my place now to repeat this to you. Just very briefly, uh, the expansion in, uh, um, intron 1 of this gene um, causes a reduction in the amount of um, transcript, which is the mRNA. Uh, I, don't know, I guess and over the years you must have heard this, uh, so I don't, I don't want to repeat things that you have heard so many times. Uh, DNA is, is uh, transcribed into mRNA, and this is this, the messenger, basically, to make a protein, in this case, protaxin. And so the, the uh, outcome of having this expansion in the intron is that less mRNA is produced and, and uh, as a consequence, not, not enough protein is made. And uh, I know uh, um, Rob will go over this, so I'll, I'll skip it. And uh, I briefly mentioned before in the first part of the talk what uh, the role of rataxin is in maintaining uh, the function of mitochondria. And this slide is actually um, a little more specific and it addresses, uh, I would say, the two main, uh, the two main putative function of, of rataxin. One that is quite certain, I think, at this point, uh, there is wide consensus in the field, that frataxin is fundamental for the um, synthesis of these chemical groups. They're called iron sulfur cluster groups. Um, doesn't really mean much to you, I guess, but what, um, what these things really do is to allow those enzymes in the mitochondria to function. They allow that electrical potential to be formed. Without those iron sulfur cluster groups, which are represented in these slides somewhere here, these things in yellow and red, to represent the iron and the sulfur, um, they are fundamental components of this biochemical apparatus. So, uh, no frataxin, no iron sulfur cluster groups. Uh, another thing that frataxin almost certainly is involved with is maintaining iron inside mitochondria in a safe place. So, as I told you before, iron can be dangerous because in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, it forms hydroxy radical, which is the damaging ROS. So, it's in the best interest of the mitochondria and of the cell to keep that iron in check. And so some scientists in the field believe that it's very important to have frataxin um, kind of uh, maintaining the iron uh, in a less harmful or less dangerous position inside mitochondria. Um, the other functions that are mentioned down here, um, I think are a little more uh, speculative and, or maybe indirect. So the, the idea that uh, frataxin is an anti has, provides antioxidant protection, well, this is true, but as I said, in the context of, of a broader uh, mechanism uh, of function. And uh, tumor suppression, 
Uh, that's probably part of the same problem. So this is to say that, I mean, there is the obvious, the biochemical events that happen in the mitochondria when you don't have enough rotaxin, and then there is the less obvious, which are like the long-range uh, consequences that having too much free radical can have throughout the body. And one of them could be increased frequency of cancer. Although I must say that, I mean, having worked with mitochondrial diseases for many, many years, I don't think that there is uh, increased uh, frequency of cancer. Maybe Dave will prove me wrong because I'm sure he has all the data about free direct ataxia. But I don't think this is, uh, is a major, major problem. Although people talk about, you know, mitochondria and cancer, if you have uh, increase ROS, you'll have more cancer. I don't know if this is uh, something that um, has been proven yet. Um, so this is kind of a summary slide um, of some of the things that I told you. I cannot really read it well from here, but uh, so one fundamental issue with frataxin in mitochondria is this uh, homeostasy means like uh, keeping things in check, basically keeping iron in check uh, in mitochondria throughout the cell. That's very important. Uh, and it, this is uh, because, as I told you, um, you want to prevent uh, oxidative damage, which is somewhere oh, here on this side. And you also want to allow those enzymes uh, to be made through the iron sulfur cluster uh, production. Um, and, and, oh, I forgot to mention heme biosynthesis. This is very important, actually. Heme is the fundamental component of uh, hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what your red blood cells contain, captures oxygen in your lungs. Without hemoglobin, there is no oxygen. Without oxygen, as I told you before, there is absolutely no mitochondrial function and no respiration. So, yes, uh, that's another important function of retaxin is uh, heme biosynthesis. And then there are things that are a little more uh, putative, if you want, in some, uh, I already mentioned that the role of rotaxin as an antioxidant, um, maintenance of the mitochondrial DNA, and, um, uh, and also the, um, the, the role of rotaxin signaling. All of these things are true, and I, and I talked about these things, but as I said, I think it's an, in a more complex way. It's not like a direct function of rotaxin but through all the processes that I mentioned before. And finally, in the last two minutes, I would like to mention something that is very important to us as scientists, which is model systems. So all the stuff that I've been talking about until now, we learn mostly through studying model systems. And what do I mean by that? Uh, anything that allows us to reproduce the disease in a lab. So it's very important for us to have access to resources where we can study the fine details of things. And of course, the human being is the ultimate test tubes, uh, but we don't want to think about human beings as test tubes because we don't want to make mistakes. So we want to give therapies when we really believe they're going to work, and that usually happens through knowing how things are happening. And typically, the best place to uh, look at those uh, in a living system is the test tube, uh, sorry, is the model system. And so um, I listed a few of them. One is um, culture neuronal cells. So you can see here in this example, this is not necessarily uh, a Friedreich ataxia neuron, uh, but it's a neuron, this one in red, growing on a bed of uh, glial cells. And um, you can make these neurons to um, express uh, the disease you can use genetic tricks to reduce the production of frataxin so that um, some of the characteristics of the sick cell can be analyzed in, uh, on a petri dish looking at cells under the microscope and see what happens to these neurons once they don't have enough frataxin. Do they uh, survive? How long would they survive? How can they take stress? We can expose these cells to, for example, oxidative stress and see what happens. The further layer, let's say, of complication is, okay, so that's, this is a single cell, but what about the organism? Now, organisms, there are all kinds, as you can imagine, and very simple one that has provided actually a lot of help, uh, has been invaluable help in understanding Friedreich ataxia is the Baker's yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, 
and uh, I don't know if uh, Rob is going to mention this at all in his talk, but he's contributed tremendously uh, to the understanding of the disease by studying this organism. Um, so that's a unicellular organism. It has mitochondria, but it's just one big cell. Uh, the next layer is the worm. The worm, this is um, C. elegans, is a very tiny, almost invisible worm. We use it a lot, well, not me personally, but uh, a lot of the, my colleagues work with worms, and as surprising as it may seem, is extremely useful. The worm has only 900 cells or so, has a few neurons, they're very reproducible, to the point that scientists gave a name to each specific neuron. Each neuron of this animal has a name. We know what it is, we know what it does. And so if we reduce frataxin in the worm, we can exactly study the effects on every individual neuron. It's very uh, fascinating stuff. Um, the fly, fruit fly, has been also very useful. And models of Friedrich ataxia have been generated in the fly. And I would say the next step after the fly, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, over the fly perhaps, <laughs> Uh, depends whom you ask. But uh, the zebrafish is another very interesting animal model that is becoming more and more popular in the uh, research uh, field because it's a transparent fish. And we can express fluorescent markers which will label the neurons that you want to study. And so we can actually keep the fish alive, let it swim in the tank, and at the same time be able to see what happens to the neurons. With a, in the intact fish. So you can imagine the power of this technology. And the one thing I wanted to explain briefly, although I'm sure you heard about this also, is the IPS, or induced pluripotent stem cells. There is a lot of talk about this nowadays, um, a lot of hopes, uh, both from the science, uh, let's say the research, and the therapeutic sides. And uh, so what these are, uh, it's kind of a nice development of the idea of culturing cells on a dish. Except that this time, instead of coming from, say, a mouse, the cells come from humans, and they come from human patients, in fact. So the, um, the starting material is skin fibroblasts, which can be obtained through a very simple biopsy of the skin, almost painless. I've done it to myself, so I know that it's not so bad uh, in the past. Um, you can grow the fibroblast, which are basically the, the cells that uh, produce the uh, collagen in the, in the skin, the most important cell type, I would say, in the skin. And uh, these cells can replicate for a number of times, so you can actually grow quite a lot of them. And then these cells are transformed uh, using some, uh, let's say, oncogenes, so something that normally causes cancer, in this case is a cocktail of these things that has been devised by very uh, clever and uh, um, successful people, starting in Japan a few years ago. They figured out that if you put these oncogenes together in the cell, the cell will forget that it is a fibroblast, or skin cell, and it will start becoming a pluripotent. Pluripotent cell means like it it's a, can be anything I want to cell, like an embryonic cell. So in a way, these cells resemble embryonic stem cells. There's been so much controversy in this country and my country of origin, Italy, about whether you know, embryonic stem cells can be used or not, whether it's ethical or not. Well, this technology, in theory at least, completely, completely um, replaces that, because we can obtain cells from adult people. And by the way, these cells have the same um, immunological um, texture as the original ones. So if you one day you were to reimplant these cells into the same individual that donated the cells in the first place, you would not have issues of um, antigenicity and rejection, things that happen with transplants. But this is, for the moment, wishful thinking. So we're not at the stage of using any of these cells, really, for therapy right now although it may come one day. Um, but what we can certainly do is to use these cells to push them, what we call differentiation. So we force these cells by providing certain growth factor into becoming cell types that are relevant to this disease. So for example, neurons. So for example, heart cells. And so 
we can kind of reproduce in the dish uh, the same cells that are affected in the original patient that donated the cells. And we can study the mitochondrial biochemistry, for example, stuff that I described before. But most importantly, we can test drugs in these cells. So if we know, for example, that a certain neuron cannot take the oxidative stress because it doesn't have enough frataxin, we can now test our antioxidants, just to make an example, not to say that those are the best. But the antioxidant, for example, we can test in a very disease-relevant system. And, uh, and so that, I think, is for now at least the most promising aspect of these uh, induced pluripotent cells. And finally, the mouse. Um, the mouse is very useful, at least potentially, and we have several mouse models of uh, Friedreich ataxia right now. Um, I'm not going to go to the length of describing all of them, but uh, what I wanted to say is that um, in, in certain uh, diseases, the mouse has been able to replicate quite faithfully the human disease. For example, I work with uh, Lugerich's disease, and we have some models of uh, mouse models of Lugerich's disease, which are actually very impressive. They simulate the human disease. Now, for Friedreich ataxia, we have mice that replicate quite faithfully the genetic situation where you have the expansion of the intron, a reduction of the uh, amount of frataxin being produced in the mouse. The disappointing part so far, partly disappointing, is that we don't have a mouse right now that reproduces exactly the disease as it happens in humans. So no doubt, the mouse is very useful to study certain uh, aspects of the biology, the genetics and the biology of the disease. We hope that uh, in future years, we'll also have some uh, mouse model um, that will also uh, recapitulate the clinical aspects of the disease. Because then it becomes you know, perfect, not perfect, because a mouse is a mouse, a human is a human, always. The metabolism is different. The way that you know, drugs are metabolized in the body can be different. But it's certainly a nice uh, test ground in addition to all the other things that I discussed before. So this, you have probably this table in the handout. I'm certainly not going to go over this fine print, but it's uh, um, pretty much uh, telling you what I said. It also has a list of the mouse models available uh, at the moment. And um, I have a couple more slides, but I think I'll uh, stop here now uh, because uh, the next two slides are about basically the pay pipeline, uh, and we'll talk about that in the afternoon, I think. Thank you for your attention.